Hello and welcome to We On Live broadcast. I'm Simon Marks, live in Washington, D.C. And these are the top headlines of this Tuesday. The Kremlin tells Ukraine to demine approaches to its ports in order to allow grain exports to take place. Moscow blames Ukraine and the West for the resulting disruption of food supplies, but the West disagrees. U.S. technology giant IBM will cease operations in Russia, according to reports citing a senior company official. IBM suspended its work in the country after Moscow's invasion of Ukraine began. Beijing accuses Australia and Canada of spreading disinformation over allegedly dangerous manoeuvres by Chinese military pilots in international airspace. Hong Kong is not becoming a police state, insists the city's top law enforcement officer, days after his men stamped out the city's once permitted commemorations, marking Beijing's 1989 Tiananmen crackdown. And the battle for golf supremacy is underway. Former Masters champions Dustin Johnson and Sergio Garcia resign from the PGA Tour, while Tiger Woods rejects a close to $1 billion offer to play in the Live Golf Series. We're going to begin here in America today because the state of New York has raised the legal age for purchasing a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21. The state is also strengthening the reporting requirements of social media companies to alert authorities to any credible threats of violence. New York is acting. We are taking basic common sense steps to protect our residents as our responsibility and our right. And these new laws today will ensure that we have more robust protections to stop people who pose a danger from obtaining guns. The new laws were approved by the New York State Legislature only last week in wake of the mass shooting at a Buffalo supermarket, which killed 10 people last month in an allegedly racially charged attack. New York already had some of the strictest gun control laws on America's books, but these new regulations aim to close several loopholes. They could, though, soon themselves get weakened or even overturned. The Supreme Court is expected to hand down a major ruling on multiple issues, including guns, and the decision could challenge New York's strict limits placed on carrying guns outside the home. A decision on that is expected as early as this week. WEON's correspondent in New York, Susan Terrani, joins us again today, live from the Big Apple. Uh, I mean, Susan, half a loaf is always better than no loaf at all. But, uh, I mean, raising the age at which you can buy an assault rifle from 18 to 21... Is that the best that can occur in a Democrat stronghold like New York?
Well, this is what happens when politicians want to go with the policy of quote unquote do something. Not to mention that New York has one of the strongest gun control laws in the country. And those laws really went into effect after the Sandy Hook shooting back in 2013. So Kathy Hochul says that this is basically ramping up those laws. It raises the age to legally purchase firearms from 18 to 21. And I will tell you that already obtaining a gun license and getting a gun legally in the state of New York is virtually impossible. It takes years to get it and then it's the background checks and then, um, you know, so on and so forth until you actually are able to purchase a firearm because there are such limited gun stores uh, across the state of New York. The problem with New York is illegal uh, guns and how, uh, and, and that is basically if someone wants to obtain guns illegally across the state of New York, you know, that would be in a matter of days uh, uh, or even hours. Uh, So that's one side of the story. On the other side, you know, you have other measures that they want to take, which are these red flag laws. They were, they're saying that they're bolstering those laws. Well, they were also in effect as well. The problem with those are these laws, when they do go effect, um, the challenge is having him as a legislation and then implementing him on the ground. And one uh, suggestion for those were, you know, just like, for example, you had those kind of uh, COVID instructions constantly going uh, to different organizations and institutions and telling them how to implement them uh, so people don't fall through the cracks to get the vaccines, then perhaps different organizations and institutions and mental hospitals and gun stores and uh, Um, different places should have those guidelines as well so these red flag laws and these uh, threats could sort of get um, wouldn't get past them and something like Buffalo doesn't uh, happen again but yes you know as you mentioned this is uh, the policy of quote unquote do something and this is what we get we get the uh, age of legally acquiring firearms from 18 to 21 and that's these semi-automatic weapons by the way these aren't pistols which the majority of crimes actually happen and i might i just want to add a caveat that um despite these strict gun laws new york happens to be one of the highest crime cities in the country now there is another body that is poised to do something and that of course is the u.s supreme court tell us more about this case relating uh, to guns in New York about which they are about to uh, uh, on which they are about to rule. Right. So the Supreme Court is going to start handing down a number of rulings, uh, about 33 outstanding cases. Usually it happens after the Monday after Labor Day. We'll expect them uh, this week for the first time in a very long time. It's going to be a Second Amendment case regarding to New York after two residents of upstate New York brought a case, brought up a case in New York, as I mentioned earlier. Um, After a a long slew of procedures, um, residents of New York State are able to legally obtain a handgun uh, for their own safety inside their homes. These two residents are challenging that uh, to the Supreme Court, saying that they want to be able to uh, have a gun carry permit outside of their home as well for their protection in the street, um, you know, citing the high crime rates as well. So uh, they say that, quote, carrying a firearm out Outside the home is a fundamental constitutional right. It's not some extraordinary action that requires an uh, extraordinary demonstration of need. In New York, in order for you to be able to carry your handgun with a license outside of the home, you would have to show a probable cause of danger uh, to your life, so on and so forth. So um, that is something that lawmakers are saying uh, will probably be a setback to the current laws that they just passed in the state if the Supreme Court goes ahead with this. Of course, there is opposition to that. Um, you know, lawmakers that support it say that this, this won't be without restrictions. There will be about background checks and training if the Supreme Court goes ahead and rules in favor of this. It's safe to note that 43 states make it easier than New York to obtain a gun carry permit with a variety of background and reference check requirements, along with mandatory gun safety training and polls and data indicate that it you know, they're not any less safe than New York either. Susan Terrani, live for us on the streets of New York.
thanks very much indeed for that. We'll see you again soon. Uh, moving on to other developments here in the United States, the leaders of the Proud Boys, a far-right, all-male conservative group, have been charged with seditious conspiracy. The group's national chair and four others have been accused of plotting to obstruct Joe Biden's election victory and specifically to obstruct the certification of that victory in Congress on January the 6th of last year. Federal prosecutors have now unsealed a 33-page indictment alleging that the five accused used encrypted messages to conspire for months. All of them have pleaded not guilty to the charges. The indictment comes three days ahead of a House Select Committee's primetime public hearing. The committee is investigating the insurrection on Capitol Hill by Donald Trump's conspiracy theory believing supporters last year that left at least five people dead and 140 police officers injured. The panel is also trying to see if Trump or members of his inner circle played a role in the violent attack that followed a fiery speech made by the then president to thousands of his supporters near the White House. We won this election and we won it by a landslide. This was not a close election. More difficulties for President Biden as he prepares to host a week-long conference in Los Angeles called the Summit of the Americas. The focus is supposed to be on the creation of a sustainable, resilient and equitable future for nations throughout the Americas, with special attention being paid to migration, climate change and galloping inflation. The summit generally occurs once every three years, but this year's event was delayed due to COVID-19. This is the first time that the US is hosting the summit since its inaugural session back in 1994. Meanwhile, several thousand migrants have set off from southern Mexico. They are aiming to reach the United States during the summit of the Americas. According to reports, at least 6,000 people have left the border city of Tapachula. What do I ask of the United States? That they help us? That they give us support? Oh, so many things. If they can go to Venezuela and solve that situation. Look, we would be happy to return to our homeland. That's what I long for the most. To return to my homeland. The U.S. has invited all country leaders from across the Western Hemisphere, but Cuba, Venezuela and Nicaragua have been excluded. The White House says that these countries stand against democracy, are dictatorships. And as a result, in an extraordinary challenge to President Biden, the Mexican president has decided to boycott the summit. Mexico's president said he is sitting out a U.S.-led gathering of leaders from the Americas this week. President Andres Manuel López Obrador said he was boycotting the Summit of the Americas because Cuba, Venezuela and Nicaragua were not invited. State Department spokesman Ned Price on Monday said the U.S. understood López Obrador's decision but made no apologies. One of uh, the key elements of this summit is democratic governance. Uh, and these three countries are uh, not exemplars, to put it mildly, uh, of democratic governance. The decision also comes ahead of U.S. elections in November. With control of the U.S. Congress hanging in the balance, President Joe Biden's administration is under pressure from a key voting bloc, Cuban immigrants who favor harsh measures for Latin America's leftist regimes. But without Lopez Obrador in attendance, U.S. officials now face low expectations for what the summit can actually achieve. That is especially the case with one of Biden's top priorities, curbing migration at the southern border. That issue is getting even more attention after a large caravan of migrants left southern Mexico on Monday, headed towards the U.S. border. Their journey is timed to coincide with the summit, kicking off in Los Angeles on Wednesday. Officials in Washington said that the summit will be successful, no matter which leaders choose to attend. Moving on now to the war in Ukraine, Moscow has imposed sanctions targeting U.S. officials in the Treasury, Energy, Defense and Media sectors. And the U.S. has issued warrants to seize two planes owned by a Russian oligarch. 
Russia has imposed personal sanctions on 61 more U.S. officials, including Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granham, and leading defense and media executives. The Russian Foreign Ministry said that the personal sanctions banned these people from entering Russia, not that any of them were planning to enter Russia. The ministry also said that the sanctioned individuals included officials who were involved in fake reports about Russian cyber attacks. The Kremlin said the moves are in retaliation for constantly expanding U.S. sanctions against prominent Russian figures. As the war continues, more sanctions and accusations can expect to be traded by both sides. Russia recently warned against sending military equipment to Ukraine, claiming that these moves would only prolong the conflict, while the West continues to pledge support, of course, for Ukraine and its resistance. Meanwhile, the United States has filed a warrant to seize two planes owned by Roman Abramovich, the Russian billionaire and former owner of Chelsea Football Club. Prosecutors say Abramovich breached U.S. sanctions by flying into Russia. It's the first action taken by the U.S. against the high-profile billionaire. A U.S. court has authorized the seizure of two luxury planes owned by Russian billionaire and Chelsea football club owner Roman Abramovich. Abramovich made headlines after putting Chelsea up for sale in March following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a sale that was complicated by U.K. sanctions on the billionaire and completed just last month. On Monday, a federal judge in Manhattan issued warrants for his planes on the grounds that Abramovich violated U.S. export controls imposed after the Russian invasion. The U.S.-made planes were flown to Moscow three times in March without the license required by U.S. export restrictions. But the U.S. government's likelihood of gaining control of the nearly $400 million aircraft remains uncertain. A Department of Justice official says the planes aren't yet in U.S. custody and that the warrants will likely dissuade companies from helping to move the aircraft. U.S. authorities are trying to pressure business leaders close to Russian President Vladimir Putin to halt what Moscow calls its special military operation in Ukraine. Abramovich, who helped mediate talks between Moscow and Kiev during the early days of the war, has also been sanctioned by the EU, but not the United States. The U.S. Commerce Department may fine Abramovich nearly $1 million for the unlicensed flights, among other penalties. A spokesperson for Abramovich did not immediately respond to requests for comment. He is denied having close ties to Putin. Now, with the debate over migration across America's southern border once again heating up, in the Arizona desert, some migrants are spontaneously presenting themselves to the U.S. Border Patrol. Here's that story. These are the sand dunes from the desert of Yuma. Yuma is a city in southwest Arizona. It's in the news because of distress calls of migrants. Migrants from Colombia, migrants from Peru, migrants from Mexico, migrants who are risking their lives in an attempt to escape the violence with the hope to get political asylum. We arrived by plane in Mexico and from there to here by bus. And what are you asking for? Asylum? Yes, to ask for political asylum. Why? Because of the violence in Colombia, all the displaced people. These migrants are presenting themselves to the U.S. Border Patrol, stationed near an opening in the wall raised at the Yuma border under the then U.S. President Donald Trump because of frozen Title 42 health policy, a policy meant to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Officials believe that their numbers are going to increase with time. This week we started seeing that decline. We're seeing right now about 150, 120 people. Um, That includes children. Um, babies um, right for this week. So it really de- decreased for us. Uh, but the expectation is that they we're going to go back to potentially the same number of people, maybe 400 a day or so. The plight of these migrants is unbearable as they travel miles in dangerous conditions. What was it like to come? Dangerous, dangerous. We were risking our lives. How did you come? Over oh, there, the water came up to me over here. Yes, it was dangerous and we cut ourselves. Unfortunately, even if this means that they have to enter illegally, 
These migrants do so only to be able to enhance their quality of life by getting a chance to stay in the USA. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Now, in time for World Oceans Day tomorrow, scientists have created a robotic system to find super algae, which can help fight climate change. Super algae are tiny aquatic plants that remove carbon from the atmosphere up to 40 times faster than trees. The robot, known as the algae phenotyping system, scans samples of algae and analyzes their properties with its pre-programmed robotic arm. What this robot here does behind us is it does the work of 20 scientists in a single year. It enables us to accelerate discovery, it enables us to reduce the costs of operations, and most importantly, it shifts the scientist's focus from doing low-level type work to high-level creative scientific work the automated system runs on a rail, which allows the robot to move back and forth between different stations. Each station has its own unique responsibility, with one of them known as the algae hotel, which provides the right conditions for the algae to grow. The robotic arm, much like the human would previously, accesses that hotel, pulls out a particular sample of algae, and then moves them to different stations for analysis. We have different imaging technologies which allow the system to see things that human eyes cannot see. It allows us to then capture that data and push it through various software packages and the software packages allow the scientists to do in-depth analysis, comparison studies, etc, etc. Biologists are planning to use the super algae as raw material for production in textiles and food industry, which would reduce global carbon emissions. In order to use it for production, Scientists have to identify the right strain of algae among 300,000 different species. Once the correct strain is found, it can be used to harvest more of the same type. So essentially what we have to do is once we've found the algae, we find the elite strain, we work out its environmental conditions to grow, we grow it en masse, we do some form of green chemistry extraction to take out the products that we need, and then we transform those, those products into plastics, let's say. But one of the really important things to do is make sure we've got zero waste. Last month, scientists recorded the highest daily concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide at 421 parts per million. Bureau report, we on, Wild is one. Finally from us today, the actor Robert De Niro co-founded the 21st Tribeca Film Festival that is kicked off in New York. And because we know Robert De Niro's waiting, we'll leave you with the visuals. I'll be back soon with another edition of We On Live broadcast from Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. Stay with We On. World. Part of being a great performer is being aware of whoever's around me right there. You feel me. We've always been an activist film festival, going back to how we started. And I think it's, it's uh, you know, stories, films, t uh, exp talking about some controversial subjects. You might learn something that you wouldn't if you're just w watching talk TV and people are yelling at each other so it gives an audience an opportunity to listen and see a point of view in a different way whether you agree or not. You know, I, it was a movie I worked hard on. Uh, Michael Mann is a very particular uh, director. He wants things done a certain way, and rightfully so. And so, but and that's what makes the movie special. Um, and uh, so, I'm 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 happy to share it with the festival audience and to get the few of us together. It's be great. Art Lindsen, Michael Mann, Al Pacino, and whoever else we can wrangle up
many other. Uh, this is just uh, Arab.